Welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. Isaiah here. I'm your host. We have a very special show lined up for you today. We are talking about rejection and how you can overcome it to achieve business success. Okay, so as a PhD, you have an advantage in this area. You are used to dealing with rejection because discovery is impossible without failure. To get a PhD, we talk about this a lot, you have to go beyond mastering a field. That's what a master's degree is for. You have to go beyond this. You have to innovate. You have to push a field forward. What does this take? It takes discovery. It takes innovation. It's very, very hard to do. Okay, you're, you're on the leading edge. Many of you are on the cutting edge, which I just found out recently. The cutting edge is ahead of the leading edge. It's when you're particularly innovative. Um, this is what many of us do when we get our PhDs. Many of us stay uh, at the cutting edge after if you, if you stay in R&D in particular. This, again, gives you a big advantage because you're used to dealing with rejection. How many of you remember what it felt like to go from the top of your class in undergrad to your PhD program, and you were just used to being successful and winning and being magna cum laude or whatever it was, doing your labs, always being the top of the class, and then you got surrounded by a bunch of other PhDs who were also very motivated, very smart, worked long hours, and then you were just kind of middle of the pack. Okay, Maybe you were even above the middle of the pack, but you weren't number one anymore. You had to start dealing with that rejection. Maybe you didn't experience rejection at all, certainly not at the level that you uh, had ahead of you as a PhD student, but you learned to deal with it. And studies show if you learn to deal with that rejection early on in your career, like during your PhD while you're in academia, and you stick with it, you're going to be more successful afterwards. Okay, so this is a very special radio show. We're going to be talking about this. We have best-selling author Coit Cooper joining us today. Coit Cooper is going to come on. He has a new book out. He is a PhD like you, got rejected from tenure, thought all was lost. He flipped the script on this. That's a little preview to the, the title of his new book. And he overcame that rejection to start his own business. Now, starting your business is our theme for December. We have a couple of themes. One theme is that hiring in industry is at its highest levels in December, especially for PhDs. Last December, we broke a record. We are looking like we're going to break another record this December. More PhDs transition in December because companies have larger budgets, right? When revenues are up, budgets are higher, and every department within a single company wants to spend their budget so they get their budget renewed. If their budget's a million dollars and they only spend 800,000, just as a simple example, guess what? They're not going to get the million dollar budget next year. They'll get probably 800,000. 800, so they want to spend those budgets. They spend a lot of those budgets at the end of the year. And what do they spend them on? Payroll for new employees usually. So it's a great time to get hired. There's other reasons too. Uh, they might want to reinvest in the company, reduce their profits for tax advantages, et cetera. Either way, it's a great time to get hired, but it's also a great time to start your business. Now, I've had a lot of questions recently since we've been talking about starting a business or working for a startup as a PhD. You have an advantage here because a startup is a, it's a temporary experiment. And as PhDs, you're, you're used to experiments. Whether you do research on data or information, uh, you analyze data information, this gives you an advantage. In a startup, you have to gather feedback. You have to make decisions on that feedback. And this allows you to move forward and be successful. Most people, they don't get feedback. They just say, oh, I think this is going to work, and they do it. You know how to gather empirical evidence. You know how to look at quantitative feedback and qualitative feedback. It's a huge advantage. We'll talk to Coit about this. I'll talk about it throughout the show. I want to bring this topic up to the forefront because now is a great time to either start your own business, to, to start or expand a freelance business or consulting business, um, to, to work for a startup. Uh, for this reason, we created a brand new program at Cheeky Scientist called PhD CEO. And the first enrollment is coming up this Monday, December 16th. I think that's right, Lisa. December 16th, 8 a.m., PhD CEO enrollment opens. I'll show you a, a, a couple of things about PhD CEO quickly here. But a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of you who have, who have messaged me are asking, you know, how did you start Cheeky Scientist? Why did you start it? There's a variety of reasons. I think a lot of people, they want to, you want to create something. A lot of PhDs, the, the drive to innovate is always there. Also, many of us get into industry careers, and it's great, and I, I recommend everybody work in industry at least for a while. Um, there are some cases where you might want to jump into starting your own business right away, but you'll learn that most people move much slower than you. As a PhD, you always want to learn. You can't turn it off. 
How many of you agree with me? How many of you know who I'm, what I'm talking about in the chat box? Tell me. You can't turn it off, okay? That engine stays on. Your brain stays on. You're, you're lifetime learners. So other people are settle, settling into their positions at six months, 12 months, and you're like, what's next? I'm ready. And then somebody tells you you have to wait an average of three years for a promotion. You're like, no way. Here's the good news. You can work in industry and start another company, certainly a consulting, a freelance business. You can go work for a startup where there's going to be a ton to do and you can create new departments, new products, et cetera. It is a great field to get into. I, of course, looked at a lot of you know, other data, a lot of studies and stuff in terms of people that are successful. Now, success is defined in many different ways. I looked for people who found that their work is the most meaningful. And I remember seeing a study that, that found that people are the happiest and they feel the most sense of purpose uh, at the end of their lives when they have control, more control over what they do. So of course, if you're an entrepreneur, you work at a startup where you get to choose your own time to do things, you get to turn things into products, you get to have more control over what you're doing, whether it's your own startup or somebody else's startup. These people had a greater sense of meaning, a greater sense of purpose. That's why so many successful industry people end up starting their own businesses, okay? Um, another piece of evidence that I looked at, other studies I looked at was, who makes the most money? Like out of all the millionaires in the world, what do they do? I thought they would be doctors and lawyers. And I think a lot of our, you know, probably our parents, our parents' parents, that's what they would assume. That's probably who everyone thought would make the most money. Like it had to be some employee or some executive. It turns out that company executives, doctors, lawyers, et cetera, comprise about 1% to 2% of all the millionaires. Now, you may not be able to see yourself as a millionaire or making a million dollars, whatever, but it's worth looking at. It's, it's a great question to ask. 1% to 2%. So you take all the doctors, all the lawyers, all the company executives, all the employees, 1% to 2% of the millionaires that are out there. You know who 74% of the millionaires are? 74%? are business owners. And this is why you see so many people who get into their careers eventually starting businesses. Why am I bringing this up now? Because I want it to be on your mind as a PhD. You have a lot in you. Our goal, if you go to our about page right now, is to turn as many PhDs into CEOs as possible. Why shouldn't the most innovative companies, the world's largest companies, be run by PhDs? People who have the drive, the initiative, the motivation, who have the technical skills and the transferable skills uh, to run businesses successfully. So we'll talk about that today. Of course, we're talking about dealing with rejection as well. I wanna show you a couple of things on the screen here. So the first is the PhD CEO wait list. So if you go to phdceo.cheekyscientist.com slash phdceo-learn-more, and we'll put this URL in the show notes. You'll be taken to this page that says, use your PhD to start and grow a successful business. If you get on this wait list here, we will send you bonuses, including how to manage projects successfully in a startup. Whether you work for a startup, want to work for a startup, want to start your own business, have a freelance consulting business that you want to start or expand, this is the program for you. There's a little bit about the program on this page. All 10 modules, 10 modules. This is our most complete, most advanced program we've ever had. Years and years have gone into this. I started making this program essentially 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but when Cheeky Scientist first launched, it was supposed to be helping PhDs turn into entrepreneurs. But we focused on getting PhDs into industry careers first because, and what I didn't realize this before, that's, that's what you can do. You can be in a company, working for a company, and start your own business at the same time. All of these myths about firing your boss or just doing it and being poor while you do it to start your business, that does not have to be you as a PhD. The 10 modules are listed here. It goes through ideation, idea, validation, value proposition, business modeling, target markets, productization, finance, sales, marketing, launching, promotions, product funnels, founding members, team roles, scaling, project management, lean and agile growth, external capital, funding sources, investor relationships, and pitching, risk management, pivoting, and execution. Like I said, our most advanced course. Now, if you get on that wait list, you'll get our bonuses. We also have a very special webinar tomorrow. It's our PhD CEO webinar tomorrow, how to start a business or work for a startup as a PhD. How to start a business or work at, work at a startup as a PhD. If you go to cheekyscientist.com slash phdceo dash webinar dash start dash business dash phd, you can sign up for this webinar. 
I think Mary Lisa helped me out in the chat box. I think we're almost at 1,000 people signing up to this. I mentioned that because we have 500 seats. Now, on average, you get 50 or so percent of the people who sign up attending the live event. Sign up now because you'll be the first to know when I show up live to the webinar tomorrow. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 12th, Thursday, December 12th. This is happening. Make sure that you get on uh, this, this list so that you get full details and we'll actually send you the link to the webinar, but only if you get on this list now, how to start a business or work for a startup as a PhD. If you're not sure, you wanna learn more about entrepreneurship as a PhD, we have a great blog article out this month. It's already trending. PhDs are entrepreneurs, three ways to start a business and quit denying your leadership skills. So we'll put this link in the show flow notes as well. And with that, we're gonna to go to the show me the data section. Very excited for this section. I'm gonna move a few things around on my desktop and I'm gonna bring on uh, Mary Truscott and we're gonna go through the data on rejection, what this means for you and how you can use rejection to your advantage. Hello, Mary, how are you? I'm great, how are you, Isaiah? Very good. I see that you have uh, the tip of one of the orange uh, brain speech bubbles behind you. I do. That means you're in the office. Yes. Right over there. <laughs> across the hall. I need to get a second Isaiah microphone. There. Yeah. So it's great to have Mary here right now. Um, thank you for, for being on. So what are you excited to talk about today in terms of uh, dealing with rejection as a PhD? It's, it's weird to talk about being excited about rejection. I think um, just knowing about it and taking stock of its effects on you, which we're going to go over in a moment, and then working and building on that. Because we do know that um, rejection can build character, right? It can, it can help you in the, in the future. So I think I'm really happy to be talking about that connection. Yeah, and I mean, for, for those of you joining us, how many of you have dealt with rejection? Josh, Joshi or Malika, I mean, as PhDs, it's something, uh, let me rephrase it. How many of you have dealt with failure before? All right, lots of people saying, yes, of course, we have to deal with failure. Uh, discovery is not possible um, without failure. Uh, so we wanna talk about this and how you can use rejection to your advantage, how you can flip the script, so to speak. Shout out to Coit, who I know is here early. We're gonna bring him on soon. Um, how you can turn this around and, and use it to your advantage. So with that, I'm gonna to go to the show me the data section with Mary and we're gonna walk through it. We have a lot of great data to look at today. I know both Mary and myself were excited uh, to, to go through this. So type in yes if you can see my screen. And we are going to start here with how rejection impacts success. So what's the negative parts first, right? Before we can flip this around, we have to talk about the negative parts. So rejection is not just a physiological experience, uh, experience. It lights up the brain like physical pain. So it actually hurts. I mean, we know this, our brain's powerful. You watch a movie about somebody getting electrocuted and this is an actual study that's been done and you have the same things flowing through you, the same neurotransmitters and hormones that the people that are actually getting electrocuted have flowing through them. Um, so we're looking at a figure and we were just talking, Mary and I, about how anytime you have a figure with a brain and imaging, Everybody's like super impressed. They're like, oh, wow, this is a real study. <laughs> but then, of course, we know as PhDs imaging, it's a little bit, uh, little bit loose. Like, what, what is this exact location of the brain here? But I think it shows some cool things, right? So social rejection and physical pain overlap in this whole brain analysis, analysis and in the ROI analysis. Um, before we walk through the figures here, Mary, was this surprising to you? That, that rejection is painful? It's, it's like, like social literally. rejection. Yeah, like rejection actually causes physical pain, not just emotional pain, but physical pain. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Yeah, um, but, but it makes sense, right? It's, right? it's something you have to recover from. It's something it, you, that you have the different hormones and things going through your body, your bloodstream, your heart starts pounding more. I mean, all those symptoms. Yeah, yeah. And, if you, and we're looking at a really eight different graphs. So the top four graphs are, are, are the whole brain analysis. And then we're looking more specifically at the results on investment analysis. So how much rejection um, causes how much pain. In all the cases, the bar graphs are fairly similar. Social rejection causes almost, almost as much pain as physical pain. Um, there's a, a particular region of the brain where they're the most equal, uh, the, the S2 region, right? So they look at the insula, 
uh, the, why am I forgetting this acronym? D-A-C-C. Somebody tell me what that is. We, I know we have a neuroscientist here. Uh, thalamus and, and the ST region of your brain uh, all light up in response to both social rejection and uh, phys physical pain. Mary, any final thoughts on this? I, I think it's, we all say like, oh yeah, of course it hurts. But no, physical pain, like, uh, you know, stubbing your foot, falling on your face, same thing as social rejection. Why does this matter? So that you actually give yourself space to deal with it and you take it seriously. You actually realize that your decisions are going to be different after a rejection. And then the question becomes, how do you handle that? Right, if you break your arm, you're gonna make a decision like, oh, there's not gonna be some things I'm able to do. Not just because your arm is broken, but because of that pain. A lot of, all of us have experienced physical pain before. Think about if you're just really sick. You're, you're in pain, your brain's foggy, you can't get as much done. We make allowances for that, but we don't really make allowances after a social rejection, like being rejected from a, a job opportunity. You get the phone screen, you go for a site visit, you get rejected. You have to make allowances that this is going to affect your decision-making, your attitude, your behavior, and you have to compensate for this. Anything to add, Mary? Um, I think just the, the idea of if you're hurt and you're going to need help with something, you might need help from other people. And so to not isolate yourself, that's the first thing I thought of. It's like, well, what do I do if I'm hurt? If I can't, you know, if I break my arm, I'm going to need help doing things. Well, if I have rejected, then I'm not going to sit by myself. I'm going to talk to other people, maybe yes. vent a little bit, go in the Facebook group if you're, if you're a member, um, but then, you know, move on. Uh, yeah. But definitely to, to acknowledge it and be around people, I think can be really helpful. Yeah, and the, and the good news is, and this is from a uh, University of Michigan study, uh, showing that rejection releases opi opi uh, opioids uh, in your brain, right? So just like going for like a long run or a workout, you get endorphins, your body has a response for this to make you feel better. If you experience rejection, your body will help you get through this naturally. So it's not like you have to be afraid of it. Rejection can be good for you is, is the key here. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this uh, at, at the end of this section. This analysis, though, I want to spend some time here. This is a meta-analysis of 88 studies on rejection published in Perspectives on Psychological Science, showed that rejection frustrates basic psychological needs. And so we're looking at a, a table here. Um, we have in the rows, uh, mood, arousal, self-esteem, belonging, control, meaningful existence, right? These are the dependent variables. And then we have a K value, total sample size, effect size, confidence interval, and Q statistic. What we're gonna focus on is the effect size and, and the, the two variables here that were affected the most by rejection, what are those two variables, Mary, and were they surprising to you? Um, mood and self-esteem. I mean, it's, it's always validating to see the data, but I, not surprising at all. I mean, yeah. rejection, you just, your mood is not so good. You might take it personally and feel like you're less worthy. Your self-esteem is, is affected. Um, right. So there it is in numbers. Yeah. Yeah, so the biggest effects were mood, self-esteem, but really there, there can be effects for all of these. Uh, in particular, control, your sense of meaning for what you're doing. Like how many of you have had a real strong purpose? You're really motivated to get a job. You know what this means for you, what it means for your family. And then you get rejected and you feel a loss of that sense of purpose. That's what this meaningful existence one is. How many of you feel a lo loss of control? All of a sudden you're talking with an interviewer, you have a phone screen, et cetera, and then they go silent on you and you feel just totally helpless, out of control, et cetera. And you either get depressed or you get really angry, right? And you're like, how dare they, et cetera, which, which, is, is, which is interesting as well. Um, we're gonna talk about those, but back to mood and self-esteem. Why, why is this good and bad? If your mood's affected, uh, d uh, affected, you can counterbalance this. There are things that you can do to increase your mood, and we'll talk about those. It just comes down to changing your perspective, your belief systems behind it, you know, getting back your sense of meaning. Your self-esteem, though, I want to point this one out because if you have the right expectations, it's not going to be such a hit to your self-esteem. You're like, oh, I feel like this now because I had the rejection. It's like when we talk about imposter syndrome, et cetera. If you know it's there and you give it a name, it's not as bad. Sure, you can just feel it, but uh, you can do things to increase your self-esteem. What you don't want to do Two things, you don't want to isolate yourself or become overly aggressive. So Mary, why would isolating yourself, it's a natural feeling right after rejection, but why is that something you clearly don't want to do? I feel like then you have just you and your own voice, right? And you can have this, just you can ruminate 
um, yeah. and you don't have anything, any sort of point of reference or anyone else there. So um, you just need to be around and, and not just other people, but positive people, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the reference points, right? You, uh, <laughs> I remember this time in grad school that uh, I had a couple of friends and there was this other person they started hanging out with and they were just doing like wacky, weird stuff. And I didn't know this person. So I'm like, is this person a little bit off or am I a little bit off? Right? Like it's hard to know without a reference point. And then as soon as somebody else is like, yeah, their behavior is a little bit off. You're like, thank you. I'm not crazy. Right? We've all experienced that before. That's the power of reference points. And so if you're like, am I a total loser? <laughs> like, am I just going to keep losing? Have I done anything good ever? We have those feelings. But if you talk to somebody else, you're like, what are you talking about? Right? It's like if you, if you put something, uh, if you go through something and then you switch it to say, well, what if my friend was going through this? What advice would I give them? It's much yes. easier to give advice to a f friend than to yourself because it removes, removes those uh, emotions of rejection, fear, et cetera. The second thing, aggression. So if we scroll down here, one of the, the interesting things is, is that aggressive responses to rejection, uh, although it's paradoxical uh, or appears to be by some, uh, it seems to be due to an attempt to gain control. I mean, how many of you have heard the uh, phrase or the expression, anger is more useful than despair, right? Motivation, maybe a healthy sense of like defiance or I'm going to get it done, good. But if you get overly aggressive, you can make things way worse. And especially if you combine isolating yourself, like you against the world, and that aggressive energy, what can happen then, Mary? Uh, yeah, you can lead to things, you doing things that you might regret. <laughs> yeah. And then you got to deal with more rejection and more yes. social isolation yep. and more pain. You don't make good decisions like that. Right. right. Exactly. Um, another quote I like is, yeah, fear or uh, from periods of low self-esteem, it's a bad mental place to make decisions for, for your job search, for your career, for your, for your personal life. Next figure, failure is common in and out of academia and even on the job. Yeah, newsflash, failure is common. I know that we're, we're really breaking the mold here. Um, but there is an interesting uh, stat here. 60% of executives fail within the first 18 months of being promoted or hired. You're going to fail after getting hired. That's why they have a probation period. Yeah, they want to make sure that you feel a sense of ownership and that you're still trying hard during those first 90 days. But it's also so people understand that you're in that 90-day window. In a lot of companies, it's six months where you're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. This is not too surprising to me. How about you, Mary? Well, I think, you know, it, yeah, it's not surprising. You're doing something new, right? You're hired to do something new that hasn't been done before. You might be pushing boundaries of things. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that that can happen, have a plan in place in case it does, but to, that, that yes. you learn from it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, same study, 46% of leaders underperform during their transition to a new role. Again, another newsflash here for you PhDs, you are leaders. And when you transition into industry, your first or next industry job, um, you're going to underperform for a while. This is why we always talk about going through a period of, of, of deep observation when you're on a new role. Everybody will talk to you about hitting the ground running, even the people hiring you. We got to hit the ground running. What that really means is listen to what they're saying learn as much as possible, observe, see how they're doing things. Don't try to go off on your own and do it. Um, that can help uh, buffer you a little bit from, from this underperformance. Mary? Right. Yeah. And I mean, your energy and the team's energy, everyone, everyone's energy impacts each other. So you definitely want to hit the ground running and you don't want yeah. to underperform, right? Okay. I think this is our last figure. I love this. The, the figure itself is a bit complex, but um, it's a great note to end on. Rejection can be very good for you. Rejection and failure is good for you and creates future success is the title. This is a nature article. We'll put the link in the post show notes in the chat box. Early career setbacks lead to long term greater success. So this is at Northwestern University. Um, what they did is they compared those who just barely missed grants like this. And this is very uh, PhD ish. Right. So they uh, they reviewed applicants for NIH grants, comparing those who just barely missed the grants with those who barely succeeded in getting the grant funding. They called the first group narrow wins and the second group narrow misses. So those who missed it were the narrow, the narrow misses. That's not, uh, wasn't said respectively. Um, and those who got the grant funding were the narrow wins. Then they followed their career path for 10 years. I love this study. Initially, 10% of misses dropped out, which is an important fact we'll come back to. But those who didn't, 
went on to have better, more higher achieving careers. As, as in the narrow misses had better careers than the narrow wins, right? Beginner's luck or early wins can actually work against you. And this is the same for industry or anything. You, if you're getting rejected now, this is going to sharpen you if you stay with it. So after 10 years, the researchers found that those who had, had an early setback systematically outperformed those with narrow wins in the long run. So what we're looking at is uh, a, a bunch of different graphs. Air bars are pretty big here, but they, they do show that it's statistically significant. And they're looking at the blue uh, dots here are those who had the early win. The orange dots are those who had the early misses, so didn't get the grant funding. In the one to five year period, they're looking at their success in terms of papers and average citations. And then in six to 10 years, they're looking at the same thing, papers and average citations. And what they found was, is that those that had the near misses outperformed those who had the early wins in the six to 10 year time uh, frame. Understand? Mary, this is fascinating to me. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, it brought me back to some memories. You know, you work hard, you put in a grant, you just miss getting funded, which means that you did a pretty good job, but it means you need to adjust what you're doing. So you become yes. sort of aware and focused and you make efforts to change. Whereas if you, if you win, you might think, oh, well, I can just keep doing what I'm doing. You might relax a bit. You might not make as much effort or, or be more sort of critical in a good way. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think of two things. One's a science example and one is a, a non-science example for myself. My, uh, my PI had a di very difficult relationship with him, but he was a, a good example of this. Got a, uh, tried to get his R01 grant uh, the first year that I was in his lab, failed, not even close. And you get like two additional tries, tried again, failed again. And then my last year, tried again, successful and has led to being more successful because when you go through that trial period, you're learning a lot. Failure sharpens you. If you stay with it, there's nothing like rejection or failure to make you really get present and really get creative. Um, the non-science example is I used to ride a motorcycle in grad school and within the first six months, and there's, a, there's studies on this too, and, it, and I lived out this study, that if you get in an accident in the first six months and you survive it, you're much more likely to be a lifetime uh, safe rider, like without any future accidents. I got in an accident, thank God I was wearing a helmet, had to go to the ER, it was not good. It was like, uh, seriously, a few months after I got it. But after that, I was the world's best motorcycle rider. I was so perfect, cautious. I checked my bike every single day. Just an example of how rejection can sharpen you. And that takes us to the end of the show me the data section. Please say thank you to Mary. Mary, great to see you. Thank you for being on and here. Thank you. Yeah. See you later. See ya. All right, so we're gonna move right ahead to the amazing Coit Cooper. PhD. I'm going to show his bio here and then we're going to bring him on. This is Coit. He has been on before. He is one of our most favorite partners. Uh, he's a keynote speaker, executive coach, and corporate trainer. Uh, he's a best-selling author, international speaker, and high-performance coach who is one of the premier experts in the area of leadership and maximizing human potential. A lot of PhDs don't know this, but he is a NCAA Division I All-American. He's an incredible wrestler and athlete. Uh, he is the CEO of the Earn the Right Incorporated. He has worked closely with thousands of proactive professionals in the past few years to develop a unique transformational system that helps audience members radically enhance their clarity, focus, energy, motivation, passion, and results. Very relevant to PhDs. He was up for tenure, was a professor, didn't get tenure. Very difficult time. We're going to talk about this. Completely turned it around, flipped it, started his own business, and has been extremely successful ever since. Please do me a favor and connect with him on LinkedIn, but connect with him in the cheeky scientist way. Read through his profile, mention something about his profile, thank him for being on the radio show when you reach out. He is always happy to connect with other PhDs. This is his website, amazing website, one of the hardest workers I know, and lots of testimonials, lots of great uh, things to read here whenever you're going through a tough time. Coit is one of the most positive people I know. And his new book is amazing. Of course, I love the book cover because it has a brain on it. Uh, and uh, he sent me this book uh, a couple months ago, his best work by far. And it is perfectly aligned with what we're talking about today. Flipping the script, train your brain to break through your biggest barriers and release your highest potential. Go buy this book now for yourself, for Christmas, the holidays, for somebody else. It's by a PhD. Let's support PhDs who write books, 
right? Uh, incredible, incredible guy. And I'm going to bring him on now. Uh, very excited to have uh, Dr. Cooper with us. And do me a favor and say hello to him in the chat box, if you would. If you're watching the live stream, say hello to him wherever you're watching him. Coit, good to see you. What's up, buddy? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thanks yeah. for being here today. How are you? I'm great, man. No, it's always uh, good a good chance to get to visit with you and your audience. So uh, yes. how are you doing? Doing very well. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, Coit and I have been talking the last few months trying to get him on the show. He had this new book out, and we've been packed with the show. And then we had an opening today. He jumped on. And uh, yeah, really appreciative to have him here. Quite, I always like to, when people have a new book out, I always like to ask the why, because a book takes so much effort, right? I mean, this is your third, third one, and it's just such a massive effort. Why would you write another book, and why specifically did you write this book? Yeah, you know, when I started the book, it's really interesting, because when I, when I started writing it, I had made this transition away from academia, and what I wanted to be doing is author, coach, speaker, uh, full-time, and so... Mm -hmm. Um, I was doing a lot of talks and um, when you travel around, I made a habit of asking people like, what is the biggest barrier stopping you or other people from living to potential? And, you know, you'd always hear fear and self-doubt. Those are, those are always number one and number two from audiences and you'd hear distractions and perfection and all these things. And I just started to think, man, I just, I, I started to get an urge to write a book about that. Like, what if you took and you took all the biggest challenges and, and you taught people how to flip the script on that because that was my yeah. most popular keynote talk. Now, I started from that spot, just wanting to help people change their lives, wanted to help them pull out their potential. And then in the middle of it, I started to realize like, gosh, man, I need this book as much as anybody who's going to read it. Yeah. Like I was running up against the same things. Like I, you know, I'd go up and go like fear and self-doubt. I'm like, here I am wanting to start a new business. And I got fired from my last one and there's a lot that carries with you there. And there's self-doubt that comes with that. And so all those things that basically uh, were hurting other people were hurting me. And so I decided, I first started to write it for other people. And then I started to realize I needed it. And really what I want though, at the end of it, we'll get a chance to talk about the other pieces to it, but I just wanted a chance for me myself to break free and go out and be able to live the way I knew I was capable of living. And it just so happens that with, with what I do every day, I get up and I want to help other people do the same thing. And so, yeah. man, I just, I see so many people who aren't where they want to be. And I would just love it if, you know, if I can help people pull more of that out of them. And, you know, my journey, I think has given me a, a lot of credibility in this space because um, you know, going through something like this, everybody's been hurt. Everybody's been rejected. Um, mm -hmm. All those things you talked about leading up to this, they have those things. And um, I never would have chosen my situation, but it put me in a spot uh, to be here right now using my journey to help other people. Yeah. And then let's talk about that journey. So Coit was a professor, University of North Carolina, right? And, um, yeah. and an amazing professor. I think all of you watching can tell, like, yeah, he's a great speaker, really cares put a lot of effort into every aspect of what he does. He's not, you know, somebody who's going to give 99%. He's going to go, you know, 100% in everything. Um, but, you know, that wasn't enough. And a lot of it's, all of it is because the academic system is broken. Uh, but let's talk about that rejection first. I mean, maybe you can just start with, you know, that darkest hour when you actually found out and then unpack it about, you know, what led up to that, all, the feelings that you had. And, and, and we'll start there and then we'll talk about how you turned it around. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I got up to the point we, we so often when I was a, when I was being trained to be a professor, I heard horror stories about tenure and, and yet for some strange reason, I never imagined that it would come knocking at my door. I always thought, man, I'm going to, I'm going to show up. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to put everything I can into it. And I did that. I mean, I worked really, 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 really hard. And, um, and I got that decision, you know, and I still remember, I tell people the day that I found out, um, my decision had been kind of delayed. It, it came to where it was like, it was, it was, it was supposed to find out in March and April and I didn't, and it got delayed all the way till May, but they kept telling me it's fine. Everything's good. And so I got a message from my uh, chair at the time. And he said, you know, Coit, I, I would like to meet with you. And I tell audiences, I'm like, man, I, I, I thought this was the moment where they were going to give us good news. And I, I tell people like, I was ready to go in get this, get the good news and go celebrate, go buck wild with my family, like go to Chuck E. Cheese or something. Like we were going to celebrate. And, and so I'm going in there and, and I think that's what I'm expecting. And I go in and I knock on my chair's door and I go in and he says, Hey, Coit, how you doing? And I said, well, I'm good. And um, he said, I have something I need to talk to you about. And I said, okay. And he had this envelope in his hand though. 
And so he sat down, we sat at this conference table and he sat down and he said, Coit, he said, I just want to thank you for everything you've done for our department. You've been a valuable citizen. Um, you've just been amazing the last six years. And I'm kind of an energetic and enthusiastic guy. So I cut in and I'm like, man, thank you. Like, I've loved being here. Everybody's been amazing. I've just, it's been so special to me. And then I tell people, I looked in his eyes and I could tell something changed. And this, this chair was such a nice human being. And he had, I could tell he had tears in his eyes. And he slid forward the envelope and he goes, Coit, he said, I'm so sorry to be the one to tell you this, but you've been denied tenure. Now, I tell people, when you have something kind of big that turns your life upside down, like I don't need to explain to the audience what just happened. Like I, I lost my job. And my thoughts weren't even the first thing that responded. It was, it was my emotions. Like I felt like my stomach had just dropped out from under me. I tell people, I felt like my throat had just closed off. I was having a hard time like catching a breath. My face was flush. And then my thoughts caught up. And I, and I remember thinking like, what does this mean for my family? We just bought a house. I have two young kids. Our plan was to be here. This was like a dream job for me in my field. And, um, and then the second thought was, am I damaged goods now? Like, am I going to be able to get another job? Like, what if I go interview? Are they going to ask me about this? And it's so crazy how those thoughts pop into your mind. And then I had like a lot of different thoughts. But the one after that was like, I knew I needed, I just wanted to get out of there. Like they were talking about maybe some other options where they would keep me on, not tenure line, but they'd keep me there. And I just wanted to leave. But I still had, I'll just tell you one more thing about that day that I remember. There, the last thing I had to do um, was call my wife. And I always thought, when this day would come, I'd be calling her and saying, man, we got it. We're good. Like, man, let's go celebrate. This is where we're going to be. We've got stability. Now I can work more on the things I want to be working on. And I called her up and I, and, and I picked up my phone, called her. She answered and she said, Hey, what's up? And I said, well, I didn't get it. And I tell people I butchered the phone call. So I should, I should have told her what, cause I'm, she's probably thinking you didn't get a sandwich. What are we talking about? <laughs> I didn't get, I didn't get tenure. And I tell people, my, my wife is one of the sweetest Midwest girls you'll ever meet. But man, when you push a Midwest girl, they got some fight in them. And my, my wife said, you've got to be kidding me. Like after everything you've done, mm -hmm. this is what this, they, this is how they treat you. And I go, and she says, can we do anything about this? And I said, I don't think so. I, and she said, well, what does it mean? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to come home and we're going to talk about it. And, you know, I'll, I'll always remember that day because your life gets turned upside down. And it's a moment where you're completely rejected. I mean, I, I had the crazy thing. I didn't talk about this, but I had like my department voted 14 0 for me to be tenure. My chair, uh, my senior associate dean, my dean, my college, all unanimous support. The, the committee in my college, unanimous support. And then it just went to a final group of eight people who I've never met in my life who just voted 7 1 no. Like, just wasn't even close. It was like 7 to 1. And so I'm sitting there and he's telling me it's like 7 to 1. And it's like, it wasn't close. Like I, I, they were based, they basically said, you're not good enough to be here. And so that was kind of the starting point of, of my entire journey, but it was a hard time for my family. No question. No, I really appreciate you taking the time to communicate that. Cause this is something that countless PhDs have gone through. Yeah. But Coy is such a great communicator that being able to articulate it is, is important because it gives other people permission to say, you know what, this isn't right. And it's so infuriating for me to listen to because I've known Coit, Coit since high school and one of the hardest workers, most positive people. And not like a, I'm, a, you know, overshadowing my lack of intelligence or lack of work by being positive, but like this guy just crushed it in everything that he did academically, athletically, um, but also was a, a positive, great person and a great teacher on the side of it. And for just, you know, for eight strangers, and we don't even know how it works. It's so it's such a black box still at so many universities. And to have that happen is, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. But I really appreciate you sharing it. And, and here's the good news. That wasn't the, the end of, of Coit's story. Uh, so that was the trigger for you to start your own business. Now, before we get into what you do and what those early steps look like, and you know, especially the early failures even along that path, how did you get bit by the, uh, I guess, the entrepreneurial bug that I think uh, bites so many PhDs? Like what inside you said, you know what? Was it because you wanted a more sense of control? You just wanted to help people? Like what made you say, you know, t talk to me about that experience, that change. Yeah, man. You know, I tell people this. I said, the strange thing about all this is like, even before this happened with tenure, I had like urges where I, I, I felt like I wanted to go out and be writing books more, working with people more. Like I, I felt that. Yeah. I just told people, I don't think I would have done it without a nudge. Like I, I think I would have stayed. I would have got tenured. I would have been comfortable. But the idea of going out and like, 
striving to change people's lives and do it on a broader scale. Um, I tell people, even when I would go back in college, I'd see books from Stephen Covey, John Maxwell. Like I used to read this type of stuff even in high school. Like I really loved it. And so I think when I connect all the points, there was always like a desire to teach and inspire people. I just don't think I fully put it all together until I got to the point where it's like, you kind of don't have a choice. Now, what I didn't get to in the book and when I talked to people a lot is they did offer me another job and it was same salary, same benefits. It was, it was a demotion. You all will know that. Like it was a non-tenure line and it was going to be the same salary, but I'd be teaching more during research less, which I kind of liked the idea of, but I went to my wife and I said, I knew I wasn't going to stay. I mean, I'd been rejected there. I would have probably stayed upset. Um, and I went to her and I said, I don't want to take it. And she says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I've, I feel like I've always wanted to go out and be an entrepreneur and lay it on the line and go try to do this. And my wife, she doesn't mind me saying this, but like she is like risk at the time, allergic to risk a little bit, I think would be the word. <laughs> like doesn't, doesn't want to go out and take this on. Like, and I'm waiting to have to convince her. And, and maybe, maybe I'm even hoping I have to do that. Hmm. But I tell her that and I said, I've always wanted to do this. And she looks at me, she says, go for it. And I'm like, like what? Like, what, wow. what do you mean go for it? Like she says, go for it. And um, that's, that's what we did, man. I, I just, I went out, I tell people, I believed enough in, in this and doing this, this entrepreneurial journey that we cut into retirement. And people told us you can't do that. We've done that. Um, we've, we've, we've basically put it all on the table. And it's, it's cool when you do that and it, and it starts to work. But um, mm. I feel like I've always had that in me. And, um, and it's a neat, I tell people, I think everybody at some point in their life should have the experience of going out and not having the safety and structure, which it's not even safety. Cause like mm. I wasn't safe at UNC. I found that out, but that normal paycheck to go out to have to like face that uh, and have to figure that out. Just like the growth that I had was just amazing. So um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I mean, I just, I feel like I've always wanted to do that. And, and, yeah. and the UNC thing, I think in a way was a gift because it allowed me to do that. Yeah. And, and, you know, whether your goal, you know, that you've had the urge to do is, is to, to write a book or to speak or to patent, uh, innovate, create an instrument, an app, whatever it is. I think as PhDs, we, we have that. That's what drives us to get our PhD in the first place. Uh, you know, you can, you have to innovate, you got to create a thesis that's pushing the field forward. And uh, so don't shy away from that. And, and don't think that rejection is going to be a bad thing. Now, you experience this rejection, this pain, this fear, all this stuff. Your book talks about how to flip this, right? Hence the name, Flip the Script. What are the key principles that the book goes through? So if somebody, let's say, let's use a very practical example of this audience, dream job. They make it all the way to the site visit. They get rejected from it. What do they do? What would your book advise? Yeah, I, I think that the one cool thing about the book is it's not, it, it's not going to talk only about theories. I mean, a lot of it is really practical. How do you get down? How do you make something change? And the one thing, it wasn't planned. Like I didn't, I didn't sit back and say, how do I flip the script? But when I was struggling and I was going through this, I had a wide range of negative thoughts. I had self-doubt. I, I tell audiences, one thing I did often and that I finally realized is I kept focusing on the fact that I'm not a professor at one of the best public institutions in the United States anymore. And man, when you do that, your, your thought leads you to the emotions of not feeling enough of frustration and do that enough. And that becomes that neural pathway. I mean, you get in a loop where you do yes. that. And what I learned how to do though, I, you know, I was watching something by Robin Sharma, who I admire, um, a, a, a guy who's just amazing in our field. And he was talking about, you know, you got to get up and you got to set the tone in your day. Well, I'm an athlete, you're an athlete. And I can relate to that. Like you got to get a warm up in before competition. And I started to go, what if I woke up in the morning and I started to point my brain in the right direction. And for me, it was just, I just started reading, right? I started to read these books about, at the time, it was even overcoming adversity, you know, and reading about Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl gave me so much perspective. Like you're thinking, I'm sitting here going, man, my job is like, this is so hard. It's gotta be the hardest thing that you could go through. And then you read, and here's a guy who lost his entire family in concentration camps and went on to like this power of choice and inspire millions of people. I'm like, man, I can do that. And so basically what I put in the book is just these, I call them yellow ball habits that, man, if you feel like you're overwhelmed, just get up in the morning and read the right books or get up in the morning. Here's one of my favorites that I did. And, you know, gratitude, just practice mm. gratitude. You know, we're so good in our society, like literally with social media and everything, we're so good at finding things to be negative about, things to compare about, we're like experts in our society. And all I did is, man, I've done this for 1800 days straight. Every single day I started to get up and I'd write down three things I was grateful for. 
Hmm. And at first, when I first started, I'm like, I couldn't find anything. Like, I'm like nothing. Like, I just got fired. I'm, I'm frustrated. And, but I refused that answer. And I'd say, man, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful that I have a PhD and I have these skill sets, man, I'm not stuck. Like I can go do something with this. And, and so I would do that every day, but then I added one piece and this is critical for anybody who's going through um, just challenges in their life is I took the most challenging situation I was facing and that was losing my job. And I said, what could I be grateful for? And the very first response from my brain was nothing dummy. You just got fired. There's nothing good about getting fired. I mean, our brains said a lot of times we work that way, but I was like, uh, uh, I refuse that. And I literally would just keep forcing myself to answer. And then after a few weeks, I'm like, maybe this is the opportunity to go and do what I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I don't have a choice now, but like, I, I can do this. And, and I kept asking that even today, what's, what's, and, and I came to a spot where I, I do this as what's the gift, like, what's yeah. the gift in this situation? Mm -hmm. And man, just from moving forward, I started to realize I could be stepping, I could be reaching out, I could be landing talks, doing things I'm passionate about. Yes. And man, that, that, that three by one, that one, the biggest challenge, what's the gift? It, I mean, literally radically transformed my life. Now I can have adversity hit me and it's like, boom, like I, I move quickly now into the, to the lesson. And I'll give you one example, Isaiah, when I, early on in this journey, I had, uh, I had one contract that was, that was really helping me. It was a $30,000 contract. And uh, as I was transitioning, and I'd worked with this organization for years and years, had a really good relationship. So I thought, and this guy calls me up and he's like, Coit, he's like, we have all kinds of really cool things going on with our organization. Do you want to hear about them? I'm like, sure. He's like, we're doing this, we're doing this. I'm like, dude, that's cool, man. Yeah. And he's like, oh yeah. And that's why we can't fund your part anymore. And I'm like, oh, what, shit. what in the world just happened? Like, it's like, and, and, and normally though, and I was at the moment, it like hit me. I'm like, Oh, like crud. Like this is another hit for our family. Like we lost our other job. We're losing this now. Yeah. Like, Whoa. But because I'd been doing this for months and months, I got off the phone and I said, what's the gift. Hmm. I don't think I could have done that from scratch, but I'd been asking that for months. Like my brain, I'd formed that neural pathway. And I just, I said, what's the gift. And I said, well, the gift is I could be creating these flip the script um, keynotes that I wanted to be doing. I could be creating coaching creating all these systems. And yes. then I went out and created them. And now, I mean, I had a, I had a probably a four month span of speaking where I made as much or more than I did as a, as a, as in a year at UNC. And it's like, yes. you know, but I, I couldn't have done that if I stayed in that spot where I was dwelling on disappointment. And that's my biggest message to people is like, listen, I get it. I've been there. I know where you're at. I know it hurts. I know it's hard, but stand up and step like stand up and find the, the good in this situation. I promised you it's there and it'll lead you to a spot that's better than you ever imagined possible. If you keep stepping, you keep looking for it. You look for the crap that you lost over and over again, you'll stay there and you'll attract more crap and you'll, you'll stay in that position. And so I think it's really important to train your brain to, to go to that side. I mean, the, the whole idea of the book is we've got this, these brains that are kind of like blah. And, and if we use them properly, we light those things up and we love our days. And that's where I'm at today, man. I love it. Uh, let me just uh, recap three things that I think are super crucial. The first one goes back to the show me the data section. We talked quite talked about is self-esteem, right? You face that social rejection, self-esteem plummets. How do you get it back? The power of asking the right question. And uh, you're all PhDs. You understand the power of a good question, right? A hypothesis, like it focuses your mind, your work. And if it helps you come up with positive things, what's the gift? One we talk about in the association a lot is how can I use this to my advantage? Yeah. Everything you can use to your advantage. When you put yourself in that state of possibilities of gratefulness, those yeah. same brain studies show that your, the blood flow in your brain opens up. That's why you can be more creative. When yeah. you're focused on something negative, it's all right in your amygdala. But yeah. when you focus on creativity, it opens up. And again, a lot of this stuff is in, in Coit's book. And then finally, you have to actually execute, right? Get in that space and then just keep going after the next thing. I love how Coit made it practical and said, oh, I just got to make this presentation. Oh, I got to reach out to additional people. You face a rejection for a job search, keep the relationship going with the hiring manager. Build that relationship with the recruiter even after the rejection. Reach out to additional people. Use that as motivation to move you forward. Coit, I want to ask I always like to uh, use the negativity to our advantage, right? So what are some things not to do? So you're trying to flip the script. You face a rejection, job rejection. You're trying to apply your key principles. What yeah. are the, like the landmines to watch out for? This is new to somebody. We're used to just really digging into the, the negativity, the bad data. 
How yeah. can we turn it around? What, what are some of the key takeaways you would say of don't do this, do this instead? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say one of the biggest things is this. Don't, don't do this. Don't allow yourself to fall into the pattern of, of disappointment, of frustration. Like, listen, there's a period when you have challenges come your way where you're going to feel emotions like you, and you got to feel those things. You got to process those things, but don't stay there. I feel like we're in a society where we've adopted these patterns where we, we get in that loop where we're frustrated and we're overwhelmed and we complain about it. And then people will go, Oh man, I'm so sorry for you. We get attention there and we stay there. So don't do that. If you mm-hmm. think that in your life or your crew, you want to go forward and have something really meaningful process, but man, get forward and focus on what you want to create and start moving towards it. And and another thing I'd say is once you do decide on that, don't just stay there. Like so many books talk about like, oh yeah, get your vision. And I think of the secret, which is amazing in certain ways, but like, oh, visualize it, feel it. And like, and then you think it's going to show up at your doorstep. Don't wait, don't sit, get up and take action. You want to be a speaker, create your materials and reach out you know, reach out and reach out and reach out and and just keep honing your skill sets. And, Mm. um, and then one other thing I would say is when you move though, I think one thing that's really critical, I talk about this a lot now, don't, um, don't beat yourself up. This is really, really big. You go out, you set a goal, you want to be a speaker, you know, you need to reach out 50 times a day via email to groups and you start to reach out. Don't go like, don't beat yourself up if you're not getting talks or don't, because uh, what happens is when you beat yourself up, your brain, you teach your brain to literally like avoid the things that you want to be doing. One thing I teach people to do is this. You want to change your life, morning growth routine. Okay. You get up in the morning, do your gratitude. And you know what people do? They'll go six, seven days and one day they'll, they'll forget to wake up and they will literally go, oh, I'm the worst. I always do this. And they, they'll just pound themselves. Mm. And then all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And they don't know why. Well, you've literally trained your brain to avoid it. So what do you do? Listen, when you get on a new habit and you're pursuing something or you're doing outreach for jobs, when you do 10, praise, praise your progress, man. You know, be proud of the fact that you've stepped up. You're, you're moving forward. You're trying to create what you want. And it's different for everybody. But man, I, when I get something, I, I like clap just for myself. I know it's weird, but like I'll clap for myself. I'll whew, like, I get excited and the reason why is I want my brain to love this process. Like I want my brain to love reaching out to people. Mm. I used to hate reaching out to people. Like I would literally, I would avoid it. Like, because I hated it when people would say, stop writing me. I hated it when they ignored me. And so I just wouldn't write anything. Yeah. And I knew I had to rewire my brain completely. And so I started to look at it and go, okay, we need to like look at this the right way. We need to start to first off, see it as an opportunity. Yes, I'll get ignored 200 times, but on 201, I'm gonna land a five or $10,000 talk and that's gonna be an amazing thing. And so I had to look at it as an opportunity and see it for what it was. Now, what I do now is if I put 50 out, I check it off on my habit tracker, Ooh, this is good, we're moving forward. Yeah. But you gotta praise that progress, man. I've worked with some really high level CEOs, high level athletes, and one of their biggest faults is they go forward, they put, put forth a good effort and they beat themselves up like crazy and they create all kinds of fear in their body. And so you have to change the way you see it, but really praising that progress. And then the final thing I would, I would say just in terms of a tip is you move forward. You talk about belief systems, really work on building the right belief systems. As mm-hmm. you praise and follow through, remind yourself, man, I'm just a person who shows up. I show up, man, I'm just a person who gets up every time you knock me down. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to find the gift. If you take all those habits that we talked about and you reinforce them the right way, then all of a sudden you've got this mindset and lifestyle that will always support you in getting what you want. And you don't have to, you don't have to gather all those experiences that cause more pain and feel failure, fear and stuff like that in the future, in the future. Amazing. So much to unpack there. If you want to learn more about this, go to Coit's uh, book here. I'm going to show it on Amazon. I know he has it on his website too. Go here, get the book, flip the script, train your brain to break through your biggest barriers and release your highest potential. His story is in there. If you want to learn more about his tenure story, how he turned things around, how to use rejection to your advantage. Quite very, very grateful to have you here. You are mm-hmm. a gift, my man. Thank you so much. Thanks, buddy. Always, always great to catch up with you. And the last thing I'll say is, man, your, your people are awesome. And every time I come on the show, they always follow up in the way that you say they do. Such kind Excellent. people, awesome people. So it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to get to visit with them. Thank you, Coit. Take Thanks, care. Man. Happy holidays.
All right, so we're going to move it right along. Quite the radio show, tons of advice there, great insights, great book. Again, flip the script, go see that. We're going to bring on Yapping now. This is our career track portion. Yapping, most year PhD, SMBA member. She's a regulatory affairs coordinator. Um, she is a business-minded clinical research professional working uh, as a regulatory affairs coordinator at the University of Colorado Cancer Center, supports investigator, initiated trials from the start, from startup to close out, oversees compliance mandated by national and institutional regulatory authorities, and serves as a liaison between internal and external stakeholders. This is an industry position. Yeping worked very hard to get into this position. The regulatory affairs world, it's very popular in industry. They hire PhDs more than anybody else. Why? Because you guys are great at documentation. You know, keeping a, a notebook every day, a lesson plan, a lab book. Guess what? Most people never do that. They, they can't even fathom doing that. But you do it. It makes you very valuable for regulatory affairs. That kind of documentation, too, very, very valuable for startups and starting your own business. I'm showing Yapping's LinkedIn page here. Make sure you go over to her LinkedIn page. Connect with her if you haven't yet, especially if you're an associate who's here uh, with us live in Zoom. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring on Yapping, and we're going to talk to her about her career track and how she got into it. Do me a favor in the chat box and say hello to Yapping, if you would. I think she can uh, come on. There we go. Yapping, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too, Isaiah. I'm great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. So yeah. happy holidays, and uh, how are things going with the new job this December? Uh, so far, so good. Everything starts to pick up for some reason. <laughs> I told you. I know. It's hard. To, everybody <laughs> thinks it's supposed to go down, but in industry, it really picks yeah. up. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you describe your current role to us? Sure. Um, we, I mentioned the title, but what, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, my day-to-day -day really differs, and the priority keeps changing. But in general, we are like, kind of supporting all the um, – um, investigator initiate studies. So um, there are times that we will be invited to the IIT committee meeting. So just listen to any MDs to propose their own studies. And once that's approved by the IIT committee, then we as a regulatory uh, specialist, we have to make sure everything is planned out as it should to fulfill all the regulatory requirements. And we also help them to develop their protocol so they, they can just um, kind of, in a way, to um, make their ideas kind of um, become a, a, something that's written down in a protocol that can be carried out by their study team. And uh, if the study has a has a pharma partner, then we are also uh, most of the time the contact per person with the pharma partners. And um, if the study has an IND investigational new drugs, then we are also their um, um, kind of spoke person to deal so, with uh, FDA. So it sounds yeah. like a lot of coordination, clearly from the job title, but a lot of documentation. Yes. Yeah. What What is the field of regulatory affairs to you now that you're in it? versus mm -hmm. to what you thought it was? Like, what are some of the surprising things that you do that maybe the average PhD who's never worked in regulatory affairs wouldn't know? Yeah, I thought, I talked to some people that work as, uh, uh, in regulatory affairs before, but they are more on the manufacturing side. For, so they got, they got kind of bored very easily because they thought it's all just documentation and, and you're kind of on a passive receiving end. But... So I thought that's going to be my job too. <laughs> so luckily it's not because for, for investigator initiate studies, we are investigators, but we are, we also have the role. We also have the responsibility for sponsors. So, so there's, there's a lot of like decision making points that uh, a lot of times our like code, our um, monitors or CRAs or even project managers, they have to come to us and, and think, okay, how, how are we going to deal with this, say, um, uh, violation or deviation of the protocol or, or, or certain um, events would have to be um, submitted to FDA for um, regulatory overview, and we get to decide what, what needs to be done. And to do that, we have to really collect a lot of information from different parties that are involved to yes. make a, a sound decision. So a lot of people also thought very regulatory, regulatory people that, because this is an in-house position. Yes. So a lot of times we don't go out in the field to interact with people. But I realized 
gathering that information and also have the face-to-face -face interaction with the study team and also with the MDs is very important. So I actually go out in the field to talk to them just yes. so that helps me to make a, a sound decision as well in the mm. end. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of human interaction in my yeah, role. Yeah, and is, is that unique to the coordinator part of the job? Because you're a regulatory affairs coordinator. How is that different mm -hmm. than a regulatory affairs associate? And along with that, what are some of the other regulatory affairs job titles and how do they interact with you? Um, they are certainly similar jobs, either on a study site or in um, on a CRO or company. And they the titles can be different from like regulatory affairs coordinator or regulatory affairs manager, regulatory, regulatory affairs specialist and all that. Gotcha. So, um, but basically we are doing something that's very similar and a uh, obviously, for, for those that are in the director or a lot, a lot higher up, they ha may have a lot more um, power to say decide whether or not we, we need to have an like organizational policy changes. And in fact, even, if, even as a coordinator, we get to change that too. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, my, I went to a, a, a um, annual conference that's for clinical research um, professionals just yes. three months ago and I presented um, after after I came back and then that that presentation is kind of the promotes uh, changes of, of one of our SLPs so just just an example and and before we go into more details I want to zoom out to I guess the the highest level view where does the regulatory affairs department fit into all the other departments of a company or, or organization or university spinoff, et cetera? Is it close to medical affairs in many cases, close to marketing? Is it close to help us out? It's close to medical affairs. And I know a lot of companies that may have regulatory affairs to be kind of independent. And some com bigger companies might have it as a part of um, under med medical affairs because um, regulatory authorities, <laughs> probably shouldn't say that, but FDA do change often. So, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. yeah, so, so, um, and every time they change, um, all the regulatory have to kind of change in a way to be able to fulfill compliance with, uh, with the current changes. Okay, and then, oh. oops, no, I was going to say, I want to make sure we have time to talk about actually getting into that role too. Mm -hmm. So were you surprised about anything along the way in terms of the hiring process or what was unique about the regulatory affairs hiring process, even if it's just the transferable skills you needed to highlight? Yeah, so I, I thought, um, I'm, I, I thought they're going to they're gonna care about my regulatory experience, and that's what most people thought. But I just feel like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on several leads anyways. And so I thought I'll just come in and then just talk to, talk to the team and also kind of in a way to make me um, understand what the team works. And it wasn't, it wasn't quite surprising that I wasn't asked for uh, my regulatory experience at all, or, or that's a very minor part of the, of the uh, why I got hired. Yes. So um, I kind of, I kind of have to talk this kind of uh, retrospectively. I asked yes. after I was hired and I talked to my colleagues and my manager, why they, what they see in me that, that will make them want to hire me. And they say, well, it's number one, culture fit. Yeah. They see that I can I I can make them laugh and I am really relaxed and but I also kind of whatever I answer them they kind of help them to reflect on themselves and that's how they see they they kind of see that value in me and the second one is they see I'm a PhD so I can definitely learn on the job and yeah. to be honest the other three people on my team they have IRB background so for them it's a mm. really easy transition to get into regular affairs. And um, my manager say, um, she kind of see me kind of proceed already, mm. even compared to someone that have several years of IRB experience. So I, I, oh. I feel like. So you were able to learn it quickly because that's what PhDs do. Yeah, and then a lot of times because IIT is, is, a, is high risk and a lot of changes, so they kind of see that adaptability will be, will be really a big issue, and they see that in PhD as well. Hmm. So, yeah. Perfect. And, and in terms of 
on the job skills? Mm -hmm. Like what are some of the transferable skills? Obviously, you know, documentation, et cetera. Can you name a couple of the transferable skills for people who might be thinking about this role? Like they want to put some transferable skills on their resume, okay. LinkedIn profile, technical skills too. Um, like attention to details for sure. And also communication because, because like I said, there's, in, there's indeed a lot of communication, either, either, either verbally or, or, on, um, or written. Um, and uh, the attitude to uh, adapt to new changes and be able to work on a fast-paced experiment, working on a cross-functional team and all that, and critical thinking too. Yeah, and, and I, I think um, flexibility, learning quickly, mm -hmm. coordination, yeah. people management, project management, all of these things, uh, great yeah. skills uh, to mention. Uh, and don't yeah. think they're, they're too simple. Attention to detail, they want to see that. It might sound simple, but it's important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Final thoughts, anything that you wish you would have known when you were oh. going through the hiring process for this role that you know now about regulatory affairs? Uh. <laughs> That laugh is hiding something. No, I was, I, I was just thinking on one of a, one of the interview question. My manager asked. Um, this is kind of the, how they assess uh, the the person, right? And then they just ask uh, if you walk into a room and there's there's a theme song, they play for you. What would that be? And I just sent right wow. away. <laughs> I just sent it right away, and I wish I remember the lyrics. <laughs> what what probably, was it? What was the song? Oh, that's a theme song for Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, other than th <laughs> that, is awesome. Yeah, sorry. I, Everybody knows your name. That song, right? <laughs> <laughs> that but, is awesome. Yeah, uh, but yeah, other than that, I think I think in terms of regulatory, um, everyone knows PhDs are great with that, and then. And then um, I also came in after several rejections um, for this interview. And, and like Coyle said, um, just flip it. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a, a failure. Uh, all these rejections are not failure experience per se. They are, they are helping us to really propel to what we want and also show us how much we want it. So, mm. yeah. Well said, Yaping. Thank you very much for coming Thank on you. to talk about the Regulatory Affairs Coordinator role. Please thank Yaping in the chat box. Great to have Yapping on. She is such a big supporter of all Cheeky Scientist Associates, all Cheeky Scientist Advanced Program members as well. I uh, really appreciate you being here, Yapping. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> this takes us to the end of our radio show, our non-members, our public version. If you want to become a member of the Cheeky Scientist Association or any of our Cheeky Scientist Advanced Programs, including PhD CEO, which opens this Monday, uh, December 16th, go to phdsgethired.com. That's the best place to go, phdsgethired.com. Put your name and email on that page and we will send you our bonuses, a lot of information about different industry careers and all of our advanced programs. Thank you all for joining us live, wherever you're joining us on the live stream. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.